This is a very late in the day recording and to be honest my love of wrestling has taken a bit of a knock in the last few days. I will however get through this, go through some of my tweets and my scripting and cover Smackdown from last night. But what I will say is that I implore anyone watching this to educate themselves on the speaking out movement going on in wrestling at the moment. I've been aware of quite a bit of this for a while as someone who's been involved in wrestling in the UK and I've been unable to do much about it because it's been something that people want kept to themselves. I'm honoured that people have chosen to open up and I am particularly proud of everyone who has contacted the police, spoken out and stepped forward today and that will do so in the future. I believe this is a vital moment and I believe it's something that desperately needed to happen for a better wrestling world going forwards. If you've suffered in any way from this, please let yourself be heard. Not necessarily publicly on Twitter, if it is a criminal matter, go to the police, but there are people out there who care and who will care. Reach out. From that quite sobering topic, I'm going to start talking about Smackdown. Smackdown opened with AJ Styles having an intercontinental title celebration. Renee Young was in the ring acting as host and the ring was surrounded by some of the Smackdown superstars. Only the men, the women would all, well, almost all be featured later on. But it does show who is missing, particularly big names like Roman and Sami Zayn. Styles would insist that Daniel Bryan come in put the championship around his waist and say congratulations, but when Brian did so, very graciously, Styles would get upset that he didn't get more. This would lead to Matt Riddle coming down, challenging AJ Styles to a match, which would be non-title, gave the game away a little bit, because Matt Riddle, upon his debut, beat the Intercontinental Champion and, in my opinion, the best wrestler in the world, AJ Styles. This felt very much like the Kevin Owens and John Cena moment, from many years past. A very strong debut for Matt Riddle. Later in the night it's also announced that next week AJ Styles will face Drew Gulak in an Intercontinental Championship match. This of course a holdover from Drew Gulak beating AJ Styles several weeks before. Styles outside of the Intercontinental Tournament has been on a bit of a losing streak recently. I do have to give special mention to Big E who brought some weights down with him and would lift and curl during the match. I love background acting, especially in wrestling, and I'm glad he was able to sneak in something there. Sheamus beat Jeff Hardy quite conclusively at WWE Backlash. However, this is apparently still going, and will hopefully involve less urine going forwards. Jeff Hardy is interviewed backstage once again by Renee Young and says, and I quote, Renee, I'm a human anomaly and I'm not done yet. Since before Jeff returned from injury, his entire storyline has been built around I'm still going. Well, we know you're still going, Jeff. You're still getting in the wrestling ring. Hopefully they can add a bit more because at the moment, Jeff's in a very difficult position in that he's been... The storylines that have been written for him are too personal, a bit too real, and not a lot of fun. Chad Gable versus Mojo Rawley comes next, which, as I mentioned last week, I'm quite happy to have Gable and Rawley on TV. It shows some of the younger talent who are quite talented. Gable, in particular, is a very good wrestler, Meanwhile, Mojo Rawley is a better talker than I think a lot of people give him credit for. The two have a short match, mostly just power versus technique, and as per usual, Chad Gable wins with a roll-up. What you will see quite often with Chad Gable is that short joke, roll-up shot victory. It's Chad Gable. He can beat people without it being a massive surprise. He's a great wrestler, and it's not... Why has everything got to be the short joke? Please get some new material. The next section before the end of the first hour is Miz TV with Mandy Rose as a guest. Miz and Morrison make a lot of jokes at Otis's expense, particularly weight-based jokes, which I'm not particularly happy about, but if we are moving towards Heavy Machinery versus Miz and Morrison, I guess I am happy about it because it will then fit the storyline. And really, that's a good way to help establish Otis and Tucker if Otis versus Corbin isn't carrying on. It does look like we're going to get Riddle versus Corbin instead. Mandy Rose would eventually come down, followed by Sonya Deville, who would run over the usual spiel she has about 
Mandy Rose getting all of the opportunities. Now, Sonya Deville has kind of proven this point on a number of occasions. She has beaten Mandy Rose quite significantly a number of times, which surely shows that she's the one who should be getting the opportunities. However, advertised for Ms. TV was Mandy Rose. It eventually does get physical with Mandy Rose slapping the Miz in the face, and Miz gets slapped a lot. This is another example as well of background acting of the Miz and Morrison in the background, just talking about the problems going on together. And what I will say as well is it was nice to see Mandy and Sonya without their men in tow. This is apparently because Dolph Ziggler has moved to a role. The next match is all about the tag division, so it's the ideal time for Sasha Banks and Bailey to appear on TV. These two have been used quite liberally in order to keep the ratings going, especially considering they no longer have Charlotte Flair on every brand. So it is just Sasha Banks and Bailey as a tag team champions popping ratings hither and yonder. Great use of them, I think, because it, as heels particularly, any heat they get for being on every brand will be fully justified and will really add to their overall arc. The match they are on commentary for, in which Corey Graves is basically silent, is the New Day versus the Lucha House Party. The SmackDown tag division has been very good recently. It's been getting more attention, and I feel it's just been getting better and better. This is no exception. The two teams perform admirably, involve a lot of flips and hops, and the Lucha House Party, as you might expect, get a lot of good offense in. The New Day do work hard to make their opponents look good. The New Day do eventually get the clean win, and they're then attacked by Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. Cesaro and Nakamura debut a new move, the, as Cesaro has dubbed it, Swing Shasa. That is genius. That is just genius. This is, of course, moving towards a tag title feud. The original idea was going to be the Forgotten Sons versus the New Day, but that has now fallen through because the Forgotten Sons have been taken off TV. I can't imagine it'll be too long before they're back, but for now, the Forgotten Sons have been taken off TV so that Jackson Riker can be a little bit forgotten about. There is a short backstage segment featuring Tamina, Naomi, Lacey Evans, Dana Brooke, and Alexa Bliss, all of whom are talking about Sasha Banks and Bailey. This kind of shows one of the problems with the SmackDown women's division in that there are very few heels, which means that outside of Sasha Banks and Bailey, not many people have anyone to work with. All of these women have at some point been in the ring with Bailey, and Bailey's been doing as much as she can to get people over. However, you do eventually run out of opponents, and Lacey Evans, Tamina, Naomi, Dana Brooke haven't been featured that much recently outside of a short Evans vs Deville feud that I felt could have gone a bit longer. Sonya Deville at this point I feel needs to get back into the general population and pick a few more fights. Notable by her absence is Nikki Cross with Alexa Bliss eventually asking where she's gone. It turns out that Sasha Banks and Bailey are still on commentary and they get ever so slightly attacked by Nikki Cross. This eventually leads into a match between Sasha Banks and Nikki Cross with Sasha Banks winning after a short technical section, which was very impressive, I've got to say, leading into a Meteora straight into a pin and a 1-2-3. Nikki Ross did kick out, but it was after the free. A good showing for Nikki Ross in that regard, because it muddies the water a little bit and makes it look a bit less like a clean victory. As I've said, good showing for both. Sasha Banks is picking up a lot of wins en route to an eventual feud with Bailey, or so we hope. If we can eventually actually make it happen as they've been trying for so long, I would be very happy. The final segment, as is now becoming normal main event segments, was given about five minutes and it was the return of Bray Wyatt. Bray appeared on screen, to my knowledge he is filming from his home and not from any WWE area, and he filmed a Firefly Funhouse segment featuring the original Bray Wyatt. That took me back. Very confused, but it looks like instead of The Fiend feuding with Braun Strowman, we will have the original Bray Wyatt that originally brought Braun Strowman into the main roster, who saw the rosebud and pulled him out from it. Braun Strowman does initially interfere in this segment, but once uh, Bray gets talking, Bray is very hard to stop. I found this one interesting. It looks like they have gone straight back to the feud, as I expected, I was aware that Bray Wyatt was taking a few weeks off to look after his new child, 
and he does still have a little bit of time to do that. He'll be back soon, I'm sure, but there is a quarantine period before he went to see his child and a quarantine period that would follow up. So it is likely we're going to see him back in the ring closer to the pay-per-view than right now. Especially when you consider that he wasn't there for the tapings that actually still haven't taken place yet. That's all she wrote for SmackDown. There were not many segments, but they were quite longer and fleshed out, and that made it fly quite quickly. The initial segment with AJ Styles and Matt Riddle lasted almost 40 minutes, and of course Sasha Banks and Bailey took up a lot of time. So your heavy draws and your big moments were dragged out a little bit as a way of keeping those ratings. What I will say is there are a lot less recaps, which I'm very happy about. My Twitter poll gives this SmackDown a 51.8% good rating, so a 52% good, and after that a 26% great. Those are very high marks, but not spectacular. It does look like a lot of feuds are simply going to continue at this point. Daniel Bryan is still hovering around AJ Styles, Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville are still feuding, and of course the main title picture is still based around the same principle, as it were, that it has been since WrestleMania, even though Miz and Morrison took up a little bit of time. That was clearly a time-killing feud. That said, fresh views for the tag scene is very welcome, and of course, intercontinental title scene is starting to involve a few more people. Plus, nice to see Gable and Rawley wrestle. I thought this was a good SmackDown, I would recommend giving it a watch. Thank you to everyone who has clicked like, who has watched, and who has of course subscribed. I have been Tom Collihue, and thank you very much for joining me.